It has been more than a week since Tropical Storm Hillary moved into Southern California. So myself, along with First Alert meteorologist Kelly Moody, are going to be diving into what was Hillary doing from the beginning to landfall and then afterwards and really diagnosing kind of the impact that was felt right here in the Coachella Valley and why we saw some of the worst impacts compared to other parts of Southern California. So let's go ahead and get started and just dive right into this advisory. Now this is from the National Hurricane Center and note the date on this. This is 11 a.m. from Wednesday, August 9th. This is more than a week before Hillary actually made its way into Southern California. And what we're looking at here is this yellow hatched area. This is designating that there was a 20% chance of tropical development within seven days. So incredibly yeah. low. This is not something that is going to be listed in anyone's forecast. It's just hey, we're keeping a close eye on what's happening out there. And I think generally speaking, it's good for people to understand as well that when we look at Eastern Pacific storm systems during hurricane season, they're typically not storms that are expected to be quite as strong mm -hmm. as what we see developing out in the Atlantic or that eventually moves into the Gulf. And a lot of that has to do with those ocean temperatures that we'll talk more about as well. We just don't have quite the environment to fuel those kind of storms. Mm -hmm. So we typically don't see as many happening in the Eastern Pacific. So again, this is from Wednesday, August 9th. Now let's go ahead and advance to Sunday, August 13th. This is one week prior to Hillary moving into Southern California. Again, we are not looking at any named storm. We're still looking at this X marking a disturbance. So still not a tropical storm, yeah. still not a hurricane, just what is classified as a disturbance. Exactly, and basically it's a cluster of thunderstorms that are starting to become a little bit better organized. That's all it is. It is a tropical wave at this point just off the coast of Central America. But notice that hatched area is much larger. Red now is trying, really trying to draw your attention to it. And what we're seeing here is a 90% chance of development within seven days days and it certainly happened and it certainly <laughs> happened so you know this is something that was being watched for quite a while and it's when it finally became a storm it moved so much faster right because it's better organized right. but for a while it was just thunderstorms out over the eastern pacific who's going to bat an eye at that right well the national hurricane center of course is always keeping it close of course, eye on what's happening there. grateful to have so many systems in place that are <laughs> keeping an eye on things. But if you think about this one week out and then you think about maybe when your prep time started at home or when people really started talking about this mm -hmm. on a greater scale, this is still, you know, just giving you kind of a week warning time to be right. able to get that preparation started. Of course, we started talking about it as soon as it became something where we could tell that that path could be heading in our direction. Exactly. It was actually on Monday. So this was a Sunday. I'm back in the studio on Monday and we were already talking about it. It yeah. was being a discussion on Facebook or in my Facebook chats and each and every day leading up as more and more development was there. We just continue to dive into that discussion. So we're keeping an eye on it. But yeah, when it's just about that seven day window, that's when the meteorologist and your local market where you're actually watching are going to be tuning in any yeah. long range forecast. It's a little wishy washy, yeah. especially here just because of our steering currents or steering pattern. And even with something like that, I think at the most we're looking at that going, okay, maybe it's going to head our direction. Maybe it'll veer mm -hmm. east, maybe it'll veer west. At the bare minimum, we're going to see more moisture. It's exactly. going to get muggy. It's maybe going to fuel some potential thunderstorms in our right. area, but there's not a lot more we can tell about this right. preliminarily. Because it isn't anything no. at this point. Um, so let's go ahead and now look at how it forms because again that was just a 90 percent chance of development it had not developed um, it would not actually develop into a tropical storm until wednesday 8 a.m that's when that advisory came out actually naming hillary as a tropical storm so kelly if you want to kind of go through sure. some of the setup here. We're going to walk you through what is actually taking place in the development process. Yeah, so what we see here is we've got that warmer surface level heat, that 80 degrees in place of the water temperatures and all that moisture that's building above this. And at this point, we're just seeing some of those lighter winds developing, maybe starting to get into those early stages of some of that rotation happening. But anytime, we talk about this all the time, anytime we've got that warmer air or water at the surface and additional moisture, that's kind of that set up to create something that has some potential development that could eventually increase the chances for thunderstorms, which is what we then start to see. It increases that air rising. And with that, 
that's when we start to see those storms really developing. That's when you start to see some of those real dark cumulonimbus clouds that we will see in association with these storms. And as we continue to fuel this with more and more of that outside air, it just keeps rising. And that really helps with the continued motion that we see in these storms. It has a lot to work with because it's all moisture underneath it. When you're talking about a tropical storm mm -hmm. or a hurricane, they have an unlimited amount of moisture to pull off of when they are out in the ocean. And that's what can lead to some of that pretty fast development where we go quickly from a tropical storm to a category one to, in this case, a category four storm. Exactly. And so we continue to just watch this development happen as these storms move. So at this point, we talk a lot about the winds inside that storm and how dramatic they can be. The storm itself may not be moving that quickly. It could just be moving at 15 mm -hmm. to 20 miles per hour, inching closer and closer. So we watch as these storms strengthen in themselves and then continue to move closer to home in that process. Right, and you're saying, you know, there's just an abundance of moisture as these storms are out over the open water. That's where they're always going to be developing, right. always going to be forming. But a big part of that is it has to be warm water. So right. Kelly was just showing you about 80 degree temperature water, and that's exactly what was happening all along the coastline of Mexico. Now, this originally started as the cluster of storms uh, just off the central, uh, off the coast of Central America, and then really continued to develop off the southern coast of Mexico. And you just see how warm these waters yeah. are. We're talking about uh, ocean temperatures that are in excess of 80 degrees. Right. And so this is a big part of the fuel. If it's cold water, we're not going to get any energy out of that system. And that's a big reason why Southern California does not see hurricanes all that often. Our waters are just so much cooler up yeah, here. Yeah, even just the difference between the color contours that mm -hmm. we've got here from here up to the coast. You know, if you ever head out to the coast, go to the Pacific, spend some time in the water, you know it's pretty chilly even in the summer. So there's a really big difference between where Hillary was developing mm -hmm. and where Hillary would eventually end up. And that does have a lot to do then with how we watch that weakening process happen exactly. and how we set those expectations in terms of how that storm will continue to travel and develop and then start to lose that development right. as it gets closer to home. So before it weakens, we saw Hillary rapidly intensify right. very, very quickly. So just going back in the timeline, it was Wednesday yeah. that Hillary was actually a named storm, becoming a tropical storm. So not even a hurricane, not, not a yet. measurement. It doesn't have a category. We are still talking about winds that are under 74 miles per hour, and that would be maximum sustained winds. Mm -hmm. So Hillary, again, just becoming a tropical storm Wednesday morning. By Thursday morning, that is when Hillary became a Category 1 hurricane with maximum sustained winds of 75 right. miles per hour. Again, Hillary is out over incredibly warm waters in excess of 80 degrees. But even then, just barely right. a Category 1 right. storm. Right, just barely. But the very, very rapid uh, development of this system from a Category 1 to a Category 4 within 24 hours. We are talking about... Um, just a rapid speed. So with that category four, you can see where the numbers jump up. It goes from 130 to 156 miles per hour. So originally going from 75 miles per hour to 140 miles per hour. That came in at the Thursday 11 p.m. advisory Pacific time uh, when we are looking at just the strength. I yeah. mean, that that's a big difference when we're talking about wind speeds. And again, that's maximum sustained wind. That's not gust. So right. the gusts are going to be even greater than what we're seeing there. And what's interesting with that, too, is I think, you know, everyone starts to hear, oh, my gosh, a Category 4 storm. That's enormous. That's coming toward us. But this is where that knowledge comes in. Mm -hmm. We knew that it was never going to make that sort of a landfall right. because of a few different elements. One, that cold water mm -hmm. that it's eventually going to meet up with, or at least cooler water that just lives off of the coastline right. for us, but also the fact that with landfall, any time with a hurricane, it's going to pretty quickly get torn up. Right. Because these storms have the ability to just thrive when they're out over water, the minute they start to get any sort of friction, mm -hmm. they pretty much deteriorate pretty quickly. And while that can be a pretty dramatic process and certainly still a plenty impactful one, 
that mixed with the terrain of where it did eventually make that landfall mm -hmm. now down to a tropical storm mm -hmm. in areas of northern Baja Peninsula that whole process allows that storm to get torn up but this was when we really started to change our language a little bit and when we needed to make some clarification because I think we worried immediately okay people at home are hearing that this storm is weakening right that's going to mean that they'll let their guard down that they won't be as concerned exactly. but we knew that there was still plenty cause for concern because that's just a natural part of this process exactly. the impact was not changing the forecast for the impact was not changing for the Coachella Valley yeah so I was definitely seeing that because I was uh, updating social media every time an advisory co would come out from the National Weather Service just relaying what the most recent information from the hurricane hunters may have been and so with each of those advisories coming out it was talking about a weakening and I was seeing comments yeah. about oh, oh it won't be so bad it's not going to be anything yeah. knew it not going to be anything but we were never under a hurricane watch. We were never under a hurricane warning. It was always a tropical storm. That weakening was expected, but just because an overall storm is weakening doesn't mean it's losing any of that moisture. It doesn't mean it's still not going to be bringing strong thunderstorms into the region. And that's, right. that's exactly what we ended up seeing. So let's go over um, some of the impacts that we actually saw uh, here in the coast because I think throughout our forecast, um, we were calling for a first alert weather alert day. And these were the main threats that we were going to be focusing on from the get-go. Our main concern was going to be flooding. Yeah. Not only just because there's a lot of rain associated with it, but we know the Coachella Valley. Rain elsewhere does not have the same kind of impact on the environment like it does here in the desert. Right. We are just not built for that extensive of amount of rainfall. So we knew flooding, that was going to be an extreme risk for us, an extreme threat. But of course, heavy rain has to be high. We are talking about heavy rain that would have a high threat around the Coachella Valley. But again, flooding is more extreme and that had a big part of runoff. Yeah. Higher rainfall totals are going to be for the mountains gravity is going to do its job it's going to take that water drag it down to lower elevation in turn increasing our flood threat here in the desert and when we talk about setting some of those expectations we know that if we're expecting maybe an inch mm -hmm. which is significant mm -hmm. for palm springs uh you know give or take that's already going to be the potential for some high to extreme flooding right. because we know that typically in that circumstance, our mountains are sponges right. and they soak up a lot of that moisture before we even get the chance to see it. But when they see excess amounts, all of that has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time it's ending up in our washes. That's why we so often see roads closed through popular areas in Palm Springs, Cathedral City, even down toward the East Valley. And that's because even if we didn't see a lot of rain here locally, if the mountains did, there's cause for concern. So exactly. when we were seeing preliminary numbers that were ranging anywhere from three to six inches or so, mm -hmm. that led to huge concerns specifically for flooding. And I will say I was even hesitant to discuss we both those. Were. <laughs> I mean, the, these were numbers from the weather models that were coming out. These are numbers that we do not see here in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, we just, we don't. We average 4.61 inches of rain in an entire year in Palm Springs. And yet these models are coming out depicting more than a year's worth of rain in one weekend. And so yeah. this is where, you know, I think there's so much conversation these days around AI, computer generation, mm -hmm. and like what you can rely on, what you can't, even your apps on your phones. Mm -hmm. And of course, you should always have your first alert weather app. But <laughs> in terms of where you need that human touch, we know the valley, we know the geography, we know these elements that happen on an annual basis. So we're able to look at that and make fair assessments mm -hmm. based off of that historic knowledge that we have and based off of the realistic knowledge that we have just of the area. Right. So when you're seeing such high numbers like that, as a meteorologist, you're immediately going, whoa, that model is way overdoing it. It just doesn't know how to handle our area. It's not used to taking an Eastern Pacific storm system like this. There's not mm -hmm. enough historic data there for it to be able to work with. So we immediately go, okay, let's calm down. Let's taper this right. back a little bit. But when you're starting to see models consistently line up like that, yeah. You're still going, are we sure? So I think still in my language yeah. on Wednesday, um, I was still so like, how am I going to say this? How am I going to say this? And we were having conversations even yeah. into my forecast on Saturday evening right. about just even minute changes right. to rainfall tools, but we knew how big of a difference they right. would make. So even on Wednesday, I'll be honest, I was not 
specific in the amount that we were looking at. I was talking more about potential, and that's a big part of what just meteorologists do, is we can't say for certain this is happening in your backyard. Right. However, we can say that their potential does exist for this event to happen. And so I did say inches of rain, and even alone I was still <gasps> In inches of yeah. rain is a huge <laughs> impact here in the desert. And so until, you know, heading through the kind of the latter half of, of the week, was able actually to put some numbers on a map and still say, you know, this, this is consistent. This is consistently what we were looking at. And yeah. a general trend as we were kind of uh, getting closer and closer to the event was looking at four inches in the Coachella Valley. Here's a look at some of those rainfall totals that ended up occurring over two days uh, right here in the desert. Now notice Palm Springs, Cathedral City, even Palm Desert, you do see them under four inches. These are numbers that were coming directly from National Weather Service sensors. I will say there were other monitors in the Coachella Valley that were reporting an excess of four inches. Right. But you have to think about how localized it is. So in one backyard, there's going to be a lot more rain than somebody else's backyard. So generally, when we're seeing Palm Desert just shy of four inches, those models were pretty spot on, yeah. especially when you look at other locations like Whitewater, which has just a little bit more elevation more than six and a half inches. And then you look at our mountains, we were talking about runoff, Mount San Jacinto is coming in at more than 11 and a half inches of rain. Those are big numbers for Southern California. That's not going to stay on the mountain. That's going to come to the desert where there's already been heavy rainfall. I remember at a certain point on Sunday night, I started just putting out hourly updates on social media of what the rainfall totals were coming in at, just hour to hour, pretty much, mm -hmm. we'll say roughly, uh, and seeing just some of those jumps even, mm -hmm. hour to hour. Because even at that point, we were still holding our breath going, is this forecast going to check out? Is it really going right. to be that much right. rain? Because our goal is to get as accurate as possible with what we forecast and those impacts. And sure enough, this was really quite spot on with what we were saying going into this event, um, you know, up into the last minute, this really did line up with our expectations. I remember saying uh, upwards of eight inches with pockets that could be around 12 inches yeah. or so for the mountains. You know, easily, I remember us saying spots between, we ranged from two to five inches, we mm -hmm. boosted it at one point, I think to three to six inches, but we were always within range of what was expected out of this as hesitant as we were and just looking at it now we, we've seen the damage that has been done from the flooding and that was with numbers like this yeah and so it's just the thought of when those models were trending a little bit higher of five to seven inches imagine it could imagine, have been worse well, <laughs> right it's just imagine the magnitude at how much that impact really jumps going from just under four inches to excess of five inches potentially that's going to, I mean, it already wreaked havoc in the Coachella Valley, but it could just have that much more of an impact. And the potential was there. It was really just some subtle changes, the placement of the system, that really all makes an impact at the end of the day. So obviously we knew that heavy rain and flooding were going to have huge impacts on the Coachella Valley, but just by the very nature that this was a hurricane, then tropical storm system, winds are also an enormous concern. And I think this was interesting. We're used to winds being, uh, issue around here and one that we've become quite accustomed to. I think every now and then we get an event where people are like, wow, that was a lot more wind than normal. Right. But I sometimes think we become a little bit desensitized as a community to just how impactful wind could be. So we had high winds, I think, at their peak in that high category. Mm -hmm. Some of the peak wind speeds that we saw coming through, if we can move to those, those were ranging for some spots between 40 to 50 miles per hour. Uh, the strongest, of course, in Whitewater. That's just where Whitewater is and how things go with the geography there that we did see a peak wind gust of 70 miles per hour. But I think what's different about this compared to other wind events that you probably felt at your own home is these peak wind gusts were practically sustained. I mean, they went on at strengths like this for long periods of time, mm. an hour, two hours. I remember watching Marion Bouchot out in the field go from soaking wet to freezing as these winds were just tossing her about out mm. in the field. And they stayed with us for quite some time before they really were able to move on. So the problem with that was they were able to do quite a bit of damage. And you think about, you know, rain, weakening things, weakening trees, weakening structures, and then you throw wind at them, 
that's packing a punch on something that has already lost a little bit of structural integrity. Exactly. Adding into the rain part, the rain was not heavy Sunday morning, but it was still raining. It was still enough to actually create some ponding on the roadways. I experienced that here in Thousand Palms right outside our, our television station. Um, but it was still rather consistent in the early morning hours. So you have to think that's already wetting the grounds. Mm -hmm. Then the heavy rain moves in and saturates as much as it can of the soil. Our soil doesn't really absorb any of that water, but it's still it's saturating it. Then you add the wind after that, that's going to basically weaken anything that is in. So those trees, they're not going to stand as firm because right. that soil has a little bit more movement to it now because of that heavy rain. And I think another big part of this is when we experience winds, they're predominantly out of the west. Yep. They're coming in through the San Gorgonio Pass. We have turbines there for a reason. If you see a lot of the trees around the desert, they're aimed in one direction because yeah. our winds are, are common from the west. We experience Santa Ana winds, but not nearly as impactfully, it, typically speaking. If, right here, right? If yeah. you go towards the Cajon Pass west sure. of here, very different story. But these winds were coming at us from the southeast, yeah. a, a very different direction than what we normally see. So when you add in a new direction where things haven't really grown with that that strength that kind of force that's not used to it and then you add just the sustained amount of time that was there that's also going to be playing a role into it absolutely there was even a threat of tornadoes thankfully nothing ever developed out of that tracking some rotation on air for we you did see some rotation which from a meteorological perspective can be quite exciting when you have that on mm -hmm. the ground but of course it's also this imminent threat where you're going okay Again, this is not something we typically see in the desert. Right. So what am I looking at and how do we need to appropriately prepare and respond to this? Right. And there was at one point, it was right around 145, but we had seen uh, some, two severe thunderstorm warnings mm -hmm. in effect for the valley. And we were looking out toward the Box Canyon area and we suddenly saw that there could be some rotation in place. We stayed on air during that to make sure that we weren't looking at something that could become more severe. Thankfully, in that scenario, it did not not. Mm -hmm. That was about the extent of the rotation that right. we were able to detect here locally. We kept an eye on multiple different pockets of heavy rainfall, some that were starting to develop into their own cells here and there, plenty of action to the south and to the southeast of right. us that we were keeping an eye on, but nothing that actually came to fruition in the form of a tornado here locally. Right. And I do have to say that was just so great having Kelly in studio. We were both in this together and it was just- We were just, playing tandem for sure, yeah. Right. And it really amplified our coverage because the minute those severe thunderstorm warnings began issued, Kelly got on air and I was on Facebook Live. And so we were able to provide coverage to as many people as quickly as we could, both on air, and maybe some people just didn't have, were out of power already. And, That's and always a concern for and us. And only had access to, to their phone and social yeah. media. So we, we want to get the coverage out as quickly as possible, especially when there is a threat like strong winds that could be blowing debris. Or while she was on air, we start to see that strong rotation. And so just really grateful we were both here in studio. We were really, really right. able to provide the coverage. And so thank you to everyone who did tune in, whether it was on air or online, leaving comments and letting us know what was happening where you were. Yeah, we really do rely so much on both our team here at the station, when we've got people out in the field, both Marion and Marco were key in mm -hmm. terms of what they were experiencing out there to help us confirm what we were seeing on our end, looking at our computers, but then also all of you at home and the outpouring of people who sent us photos, videos to share at KESQ.com. That was so important for us to be able to get a good understanding of what was happening out in the community so we could further that messaging and make sure that we were keeping other people safe in the process. You were really our eyes and ears and we relied quite heavily on that. So we're grateful to all of you who were and, a part of that. I mean, our, our share email, share inbox, the share at KESQ.com. Completely has, inundated. Inundated <laughs> is the word there. I think if- And if, we're grateful for it. Yes, if we had a threat index about the email, that would have been in the extreme <laughs> as well. Um, because thank you to everyone who sent their photos, their videos, their storm reports um, that were out there. So uh, any other takeaways from this experience? Yeah, I think at one point uh, we started to notice that we were picking up on much much stronger impacts than areas to the west of that. Now, part of that is that our mountains just serve as a barrier, mm -hmm. but we were also located in what's considered to be one of the strongest areas of a storm, mm -hmm. and that's in that upper right quadrant. When you think about that counterclockwise motion that these storms take, 
that fuel of energy from off the coast with moisture and then continuing to push that up into our area. That's really where we were seeing some of those stronger gusts that mm -hmm. were sticking with us for a couple hours, some of those heavier pockets of rainfall and then the eventual flooding. Mm -hmm. That's why we saw such a strong impact out here paired with the fact that infrastructure wise, we're just not built for that much moisture and it doesn't have a lot of places to go, which is why we're now dealing with that cleanup of so much mud that's all just been settling there and sort of getting dried up by the sun. But it's right. been just a long cleanup process and will continue to be as we work with those impacts just because there's not a lot of great opportunities for water to escape the valley. Exactly, and that is continuing to have an impact on our weather when it comes to air quality mm -hmm. here in the desert. Um, you know, it's been very sunny and that has allowed a lot of the water to dry up, the mud to dry up and clean up to continue. But as that dries up, that just just going to be becoming dust as it is lofted up into the air. And we yep. really saw that reducing air quality on Thursday, uh, last Thursday, but it's, there's still a lot more cleanup to do. So just know that that could be uh, a continued impact when we're talking about air quality. Hillary is long gone, but still obviously being, being felt. The impacts are definitely going to be a bit longer than what Hillary's track was. Right. Part of our first alert branding is that we are giving you the earliest heads up possible whenever there is something coming your way that could be impactful, whether that's a severe storm or strong winds or flooding like what we saw. Not all storms give us this much lead time, but we did our very best to bring you as much information as long out as we could before we saw this storm arrive. So we continue to just be really grateful for all of you for tuning in for that. Yeah, thank you for trusting us and the First Alert Weather Team will continue to bring you the forecast every day.